Welcome to this edition of Founder Stories. I'm Mike Abbott, and today with me I have Bradford Cross from Prismatic. Welcome, Bradford. Thanks, Mike. So tell us a little bit about uh, Prismatic. Yeah, so Prismatic is um, basically a, th a tool to make people's lives more interesting. We help people discover uh, the most interesting content around for them based upon their interests. Um, and we have about six people right now, uh, myself. We have three CS PhDs. Uh, one graphic designer and one community person and we're just about to start growing and adding a bunch more people So we're stoked. Awesome. Congratulations. Yeah, thanks. Kind of leads me to my, my first question Which is you've got designers you've got engineers you're building a consumer product mm -hmm. What have you seen kind of work or not work because you've gotten designers to work with engineers to mm -hmm. get your first version of product out? Mm -hmm. So I, I think based on my experiences in the past I've really found that you need to set the DNA of a company pretty early and you need to choose the problems that you want to tackle and basically build the whole company around that, not just really sort of like look at hiring particular roles. So with us, we found, you know, it's tech and it's design and it's marrying the two, you know, because unlike Google, where you find a thing and you go away, with Prismatic, it's about finding a thing that you're discovering and then actually interacting with it there, whether it's reading something, watching a video, whatever. And so having that design go together with the relevance has been critical for us. And it was a rocky road, honestly. I would, I would say it was about 12 months before we were good at doing both of them in unison. Um, and we, we went through like different hires and fires. We went through, you know, quite a large, large amount of time just kind of like digging in ourselves. Aria, my co-founder and I, uh, have gotten much better at design and understanding design over so, the course so, of the time. So through those 12 months, yeah. what were the kind of one or two takeaways from you? Yeah. Uh, and, and like that, the, during those rocky times yeah. that you got through. I think the biggest thing was if you really want to invest in something like this and try to make it core to the company, you have to be willing to pay the dues. You can't say to yourself, you know, we're going to make a great product company, but I'm a technical guy. I'm just going to have a product co-founder or just hire some VP product or whatever, and they're going to figure it out. I think that's a, kind of a rubbish idea. If you really want to get core at something you know, with your business, then you have to tackle it yourself and really sort of pay your dues. It doesn't mean that you have to become a world-class designer, but you're not going to be able to spot or work with a world-class designer unless you're willing to pay your own dues, be able to speak their language, right? So we had to literally dig in and learn the language of design, learn the technical craft, be able to talk about grids and type and color and so on, um, and also with interaction design, right? So like you have visual and interaction in our case. So, you know, making that huge investment was what basically like paid us back in spades. So we've done that now, like with recruiting and various other functions in the business, we've taken that same tact where it's basically, you know, if you want to get good at this, you have to be willing to dig in and pay your dues and expect a three month battle of really learning a lot about it. You know, it's, so we're doing the exact same transformation right now with recruiting. So actually on the recruiting side, obviously we're in a very, very competitive market for mm -hmm. engineers and designers. Mm -hmm. um, what, have, what are you kind of seeing working or not working as you're building out your team? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So uh, again, I think people, see this, you know, what I'm mentioning, when they see you spending so much time and committing to it, um, they, they see and understand that you're serious about it because they can come and visit the office and they'll see that you've structured the office in a way that's like friendly to designers and like the way that design uh, and engineering works together uh, is nice, right? And then they see it when you approach them because we put the same kind of thoughtfulness into learning about somebody when we're going to recruit them, right? And so when we approach someone, we already know a tremendous amount about them. And then we've really honed in on exactly what they think we think they can kick butt at, at, at Prismatic. And then we approach them, you know, with a direct link saying, hey, you know, we think you're awesome because of the following. Um, this is why we think this is a great place to work. And like, you know, you may have heard about us or whatever. If not, here's a bunch of information. Uh, if this looks exciting, you know, come check it out. And we have this cool like people page and everything that people come and see. You know, a lot of times they read about our backgrounds and that helps. So I think just... You know, being the real deal yourself and then being willing to invest heavily and in finding other people like this and saying, hey, you know, this is a great place to come and communicating reality um, really works, you know. So like when you invest in the foundation, then selling it is just a matter of being disciplined and really just investing a lot in it. You know what I mean? You don't have to be over salesy. I don't think the really great people of the world care about like the snacks that you have and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. This stuff is just like trivial stuff that everybody can do, you know? So it doesn't really matter. So when, when you go and you try to find these, these let's say engineers yeah. who have the sensitivity to HI, yeah. um, which there's not that many that exist, like how do you, especially PhDs. Yeah. So how, how have you like, actually gone out and found those folks? Yeah, well, the, I mean, 
if you look back throughout history, you have, you know, Bell Labs, you have MSR, you have Xerox PARC. Uh, now Google has separated their research group out into a separate building. So you have this history of effectively sort of pulling the research stuff away from uh, shipping product, right? And we find that there's a lot of researchers who want to ship products, you know, and they want to build stuff that, that it's, human beings directly interact with and it affects their lives on a daily basis. That's what gets a lot of people excited, you know, about making products. Mm -hmm. So uh, for us, it's about finding those researchers who really care about that and they want to come into industry to do that. They don't want to come into industry to be in a very similar environment as they are in academia, where they're in a separate office, in a separate building, right? Just working on these long-term, highly speculative things that may never ship. I think mm -hmm. a lot of researchers are pretty frustrated and fed up with that kind of uh, track. And that's sort of all we've had in tech for a while for the really hardcore research folks. Mm -hmm. You know, Google has been the first company that's been better at this, I would say, at really like getting them embedded and doing more, especially with search. Um, but we really want to try to make a home for that kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. so I think we, we seek out researchers that care and they want to respect this stuff, right? So that instead of acting snooty towards somebody who's a graphic designer, they respect that craft and they understand that without that, their stuff isn't going to ever go mainstream and mm -hmm. have the opportunity mm -hmm. to touch hundreds mm -hmm. of millions of users, right? So as you've iterated kind of your workflow between designers and engineers, how have you either invested in kind of internal tools or not? What have you seen kind of work or not work mm -hmm. to kind of help facilitate that? Yeah. Uh, so one thing is to really get design and engineering uh, structured similarly, I think is really important. So designers oftentimes like they don't have, they don't think through the problems in the same way that engineers do necessarily with the same degree of rigor and organization. And so you'll see just disastrous, complicated Photoshop files and, you know, bad workflow and stuff like this that you won't see in engineering. And so we try to pull over the things from engineering that work well um, into design and do design a bit more rigorously. Uh, in the same token, we tried to, you know, one of the things that works really well in design is uh, sort of like allowing yourself to stew and really think about problems, right, and not trying to push too hard and fast and too iterative. But you want to do that and balance it also with like longer term vision and deeper thinking and really cracking the nut mm -hmm. on tough design problems, which usually comes over the course of months. So uh, the same is really true on the engineering side, and we try to, to be thoughtful about both, right, mm -hmm. where we basically, you know, some, some in, sometimes we get excited about a new thing that we want to do. You can build it on the engineering side very quickly, but there's really tricky design problems to solve that can take far longer than it does to actually build it on the engineering side. We try to be disciplined about not just like throwing crap out there that's poorly designed. You know, we do some of it if we have to test an idea, um, but that's again where sort of like the balance really wins out and why I think we're doing a great job in terms of the process that we run is that engineering will all the time be wanting to ship stuff and be a force for shipping stuff and building stuff um, and measuring, right? And at the same time, design is always a force for like slowing down, thinking it through, you know, thinking about the user, you know, making things nice visually, you know, not creating an overloaded interface, which is super important for us because of course we can pack loads and loads and loads of metadata and other mm -hmm. information into every mm -hmm. pixel and so it's all mm -hmm. about sort of like having a nice balance. Mm -hmm. So for us I think it's been more about those human parts of it um, and we do run the same exact kind of tracking software across all the different teams which is pretty cool. We actually do that across all functions in the business. Everyone works off the same kinds of tracker whether it's doing marketing and growth or whether it's doing You're engineering using a tracker, or design. Yeah, yeah okay. exactly. Yeah. So it's using a regular tracker and we do a lot with um, just sort of like Dropbox and Google Docs and so on, right? We try, mm -hmm. we do a lot of really lightweight stuff like this, mm -hmm. um, and that's pretty much the main thing that really works well for it's us. It's interesting. The description you described is is the model that we use to to ship and build uh, WebOS. Oh, nice. Uh, Matthias Duarte and, and the engineers are kind of paired up. Yeah. And I think that it's part of this is just around having empathy and understanding yeah. the other craft. Yeah. Whether it be design right. or engineering. Yeah, it's the and culture of mutual respect that really makes it work well, I yeah. think. You know. So as, yeah. you, as you kind of anticipate in the future, you, you're going to be growing and, and, and whatnot, how do, like, how do you see product managers fitting into that world or not? Or yeah, so you, that's a great, uh, really interesting question that we're wrestling with right now. It's like, mm -hmm. how do we grow the product group? Because right mm -hmm. now, it's basically me and one graphic designer and then all the PhDs, right, <laughs> that are 
primarily yeah. driving the product stuff. Um, so now they're going back to more uh, systems and research stuff, and they'll interact with the product whenever it touches research ideas. And of mm -hmm. course, they always have a voice, but they're just not actively going to have to like build an iPhone app, for example, which mm -hmm. is probably for the better. Um, but then when you think about like PMs or like how we run design and how we how we execute on our product vision. Um, I think we're going to actually structure it a bit differently. So the thing that we're looking at now is more focused on interaction designers and having lead interaction designers mm -hmm. and then having project managers um, that are really good at basically being a circulatory system for the business and for all the different components, right, for mm -hmm. each different function. And so we are looking more at that because I think a lot of times with product management, you end up with like a second class interaction designer and then a second class project manager like wedged into one and oftentimes they're smart people and they could be you know good at either but like putting the two into one is not necessarily a great mm -hmm. role I don't think so I, I, I kind of am not sure if that whole function and the way we've typically car carved it out in like modern tech and software businesses is really like the right way to even structure like the product part of a company. It's interesting you say that. It seems like there's an increasing number of companies that are, are leaning in that direction. Yeah. Um, to kind of look at how do you get someone who's actually really just facilitating that design and engineering yeah. kind of function. Yeah. Well, it's an interesting thing about like how we're starting to see organizations evolve right now is that you've seen for a long time that that model that goes down from IBM to Microsoft down to Google and Facebook and Twitter and everyone, right? Like everybody mm -hmm. flows through. I mean, you seen this mm -hmm, in your mm -hmm. career right and so it's like oh no we need somebody for marketing bring in VP and marketing from company yeah. X and then you keep passing down that culture too so one of the things I think we're wrestling with now is like starting to redefine how some of these functions mm -hmm. are carved out you see this with the growth hacker and the growth mm -hmm. the whole growth yep. trend right it's like people are starting to look at distribution in a newer and more interesting way that's that, that embraces the realities of today's environment I think the same is starting to happen with product with like interaction design and other things like that yeah, that people strong, talk about. Strongly agree with you. And you also want to embed the growth kinds of people in with the product team too, which was also very different before, right? You have the marketing people and then the design people and their butting heads. It's like you want to embed those people in the same so group. I really understand. It's interesting because, because it ends up being from a product standpoint, you know, there are differences between the, you know, five to 30 percent kind of change you can make the impact, let's say usage versus yeah. that step function yeah. innovation yeah. that might come out of a designer or an engineer. Yeah, right. Exactly. And so one of, along these lines, like as you know, your service continues to grow yeah. and gets more popular, yeah. um, a classic technical scaling challenge is, mm -hmm. is that you've got now a service that you're, you're, you're accruing debt. Yeah, because <laughs> something that you built last year may not work yeah. next year because you know, you've, you've grown. Yeah. Um, how do you anticipate kind of dealing with addressing that debt, but mm -hmm. at the same time allowing these designers to go work with engineers to build new products? Yeah, that's a great question. We, we're pretty phasey about stuff. Uh, I think this is pretty normal, and I learned this from, from experiencing Google as well, that you sort of understand the phase you're at in terms of the level of scale, what the product things that you are going to work on in the next year, et cetera. So I think when you have clarity and you're going in a way that's like user-centered, you have sort of confidence to be able to bet on things on a 12-month time horizon. Mm -hmm at a time right and so that helps because then you're thinking like how do we need to scale for the next year you know and then you're building in things that are that you're aware you know will need to be pulled apart but that can be pulled apart and then distribute well like so for example right now um, we need to start thinking about distributing a really large index and it's a very very complicated custom index and it's going to be really hard to distribute it, right? So right now we don't we it's it's replicated, but it's not distributed. Mm -hmm. So to, when we distribute it, that's going to be a big investment of time, and so we kind of try to smartly punt on it as long as we can, and sort of schedule in when we think the right time to do it is. And at the same time, the components that are there now are built with that in mind, right? So those can be the same components that are used, but you just have to build a new distributed layer that makes mm -hmm. it robust, right? So yeah, like, I think that, that abstraction layer you're, you're, you're pointing out is dead on, uh, especially doing it at this stage of the company. Yeah. Because uh, you know that at some point you may have to look at a different implementation. Yeah, below absolutely. That abstraction. Yeah, absolutely. Right. I mean, a, we really have tried to do, what, the thing that we've tried to do is like you always have to do some debt to go fast when you're doing mm -hmm. a startup, mm -hmm. right? But the thing that you want to avoid is this typical situation where you basically have like mediocre people doing mediocre work and then bring in the smart people later to clean up the mess, right? Mm -hmm. This is a really common scenario in startups where like people try to go too fast so they lower 
the hiring bar or whatever, or they don't have mm -hmm. that great of people to begin with or whatever, and they build up all this debt, and then it's like, oh my God, this thing's working, it's getting some distribution, let's clean it all up now. And I think, you know, you're gonna get way better people if you, if you go a little bit slower and invest a little bit more, and you're bringing them in and saying, hey, I don't need you, because we're already kicking butt. But if you want to come and join in, then then we'd love to have you. Mm -hmm. That's a very different message than like mayday, mayday, like come rescue us because yeah. like we don't know what the hell is going on, yeah. Yeah. right? So you've seen that movie, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. So I think yeah, you want to have a good uh, a balance of this stuff and demonstrate that to people that you know the smart path. Mm -hmm. You can't necessarily take all the steps now. Mm -hmm. um, but you know what the path is yeah. and you can and you can show them like where you've made smart trade-offs instead of just saying like the whole thing's totally screwed it's like these few parts here probably need to be tossed out they were done as like interim hacks because we can't scale mm -hmm. and do mm -hmm. the following thing mm -hmm. because that's going to take two months mm -hmm. of three people's time yeah. or whatever you know and i think it's those kind of smart trade-offs that will let you scale well over time and also like maintain your sanity and not have like constant fire drills, right? So yeah. we have very few fire drills. Like one of the, the worst fire drill I can think of off the top of my head that we've had was one launch that we did when we finally allowed more user input and people could upload large photos. They did. So a bunch of people came at once on the launch, uh, uploaded a huge number of large photos at the same time. And then our server that was taking those photos, we just like effectively forgot that like, yeah, a bunch of people could upload pho photos mm -hmm. that are large enough at the same time and like this guy won't be able to handle it. And it was trivial to just like make it scale a little bit more. But we just kind of forgot that that was like going to be an issue, right? So sometimes you just get blindsided by things like that, you know, because you're focused on all these other really, really hard things about all of our crazy newsfeed stuff, and then like something trivial like that just like nails us, right? Yeah. So like, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, cool. it's a it's a good problem to have, but nonetheless, it's still a problem. Yeah, and yeah. If you're right that like. The, the taxing impact of firefighting, you know, over time can, can be tough for a couple Yeah, of well, the thing is, like, when that happened, right, now you have to fix it on the fly, and mm -hmm. you're firefighting, and you're, everyone's stressed out, mm -hmm. and that pulls you out of the work that you were doing. And when you're solving really tough problems, the context switching is very expensive, right? It's not the same. That's why this is not, like, um, sort of assembly line work, right? That's one of the big, big problems about the way that modern technology is run is it's largely like a hand-me-down from assembly line work from the Industrial Revolution, right? Mm -hmm. When you're solving super hard stuff, you can't always break it down into exactly the same things and like, you know, do the, mm -hmm. do the repeated move on each piece, right? Mm -hmm. You oftentimes need to sink in for a very long period of time to solve a tough problem. So context switching from constant firefighting also just almost stops you from going after the long-term tough mm -hmm. problems, right? Mm -hmm. So you really have to have your stuff together and avoid that uh, because I think without it, um, you never get to invest and it feels like you're always sort of behind the eight ball and you're always like marching that death march, right? And I think yeah. we've all seen, I mean, how many projects like that, right? That's the majority of technology yeah, projects, very, very I think. Right? Well, this, is, this has been fantastic, Bradford. Thank yeah. you for coming in and uh, we'll see you next time on Founder Stories.